Hello and welcome to our program, Violence Free World. And today we continue our quest for solution to the question of insecurity in Nigeria. And I'm privileged to have as guest the former governor of Kwara State, Abdul Fattah Ahmed. Excellency, you're welcome to the program. Thank you very much. Well, we're going to take a special report. I will come back into the conversation right after it. But here. The raging spread of violence in Nigeria has continued to defy all forms of approach at resolving it. Virtually all parts of Nigeria face this challenge which ranges from banditry in the northwest, kidnapping on our highways, the IPOB menace in the southeast, Killer headsmen in the southwest and the Midbird. Two, insurgency in the northeast. Particularly, the new trend of hostage taking for huge ransom, mostly borne by the government, has become rather too often and smacks of complicity from very high quarters. We also have situation where children are kidnapped at different levels and at different intervals and what happens at the end of the day is that we take money to go and beg them to release our children to us so if you now you are now on a negotiation table who determines the pace of where the nego the pendulum swings to now if you look at all this the question is who is having upper hand as at now can we conveniently boldly, truthfully say that our security is having an upper hand. Public outcry against this trend has dominated national discourse with some sectors resorting to self-help by way of vigilante groups like in the case of Amotekun in the southwest and JTF in the north, a measure that is more or less official by now. The attendant fear and anxiety have brought about a rhetoric of fury as people trade accusations and counter accusation as to who is responsible for the dastardly acts. We have avalanche of laws in this country that criminalizes terrorism. We have avalanche of laws in this country that criminalizes kidnapping, abduction and the like. Now all these laws have not been put to place against any one of these people. To the best of my knowledge, look at the number of those that were arrested and after arrest, they will be handed over to their governors as repentant, as repentant um, terrorists. This Bandits. is the only country in the whole world that have had that people will kill villagers, turn children to orphan overnight, sack a whole village, destroy properties that are worth millions of naira, destroy the economy of a state, and at the end of the day, the state itself, the, uh, the security agencies will hand them over to their governors and they will be received with high level of uh, popantry and then uh, joy and all those stuff like that. Ethnic and religious profiling have regrettably featured too prominently in the blame game and it is only serving to exacerbate the already bad situation. Yes. I feel terrible when Nigerian, the average Nigerian sees crime and criminality within a narrow prison of tribe or religion. It's in vogue now world over that Muslims are really the culprits. Xenophobia. Muslims are seen as terrorists because terrorism is a multi-billion dollar industry all over. And Muslims, unfortunately, has where it takes because mainly the oil wells are with the Muslim countries. It's all about that. Dialogue, it is record, holds a potential to ultimately resolve the spate of violence and consolidate our effort at national integration. But just how can we aggregate our opinions to make the dialogue measure work as we seek a violence-free Nigeria? Welcome back. 
Excellency, Southeast is beginning to look like Northeast, where terror reigns. This is how this speech started, and today we have a full-fledged war there. Now, in the Southeast, things are beginning to happen that were prior to now unimaginable. Attacks are happening, no uh, commensurate response, and we're watching. How frightening does this feel for you? Yes. Um, today in Nigeria, we're faced with an unprecedented level of um, violence, attacks, and of course, insecurity. These are reflections of situations we have found ourselves today, largely showing people's, uh, showing people's feelings towards this enchantment in social and economic uh, disadvantage. As it is today, you will see that um, the Southeast is beginning to become like what we had in the Northeast, maybe at the, at the, at the coming of um, Boko Haram in the last uh, six, seven years, you know, we had pockets of insecurity coming in, attacking security agencies. And um, because it went unabated, it now became a situation where they began to attack VIPs. Before you know what was happening, it became suicide bombing and um, wherever it has brought us today, especially in the Northeast. For the Southeast, it is almost taking the same pattern. And that is why we must not allow the same thing to happen twice. Um, clearly, it's a reflection of people's feelings towards an economic and uh, social pressure, not meeting with their expectations. And I feel that as a country, we must take these things very seriously. It is telling us that things are not going the way they should. And it is telling us that apart from the fact that you know, we are given an approach which seems kinetic through security agencies. There are so much non-kinetic approach which we need to give to this issue of um, insecurity, especially in the Southeast. Now, Excellency, do you agree that government handling of previous acts of violence, especially when it concerns certain sects like uh, Fulani, headsmen, and so on, special persons, so to speak, uh, were that casual, too casual to the extent that now is encouraging many others to begin to contemplate carrying out, not even contemplate, and actually going ahead to carry out similar as like we're experiencing in the southwest, southeast, and other parts of the country today. Don't you believe it's, we can blame this on the on government's uh, handling of previous events? Unfortunately, you see, security challenges are everybody's responsibility. Um, to the extent that government has a responsibility of ensuring that security agencies are properly equipped, motivated to face insecurity challenges and also to cope potential ones. Between you and I, as citizens, we have clear responsibilities to support security agencies if we truly believe in a non-violent environment. Because if you get to hear the various discordant tunes happening at different areas, especially from uh, maybe warlords of uh, different ethnic nationalities, you begin to see that there's no way for those kind of um, comments, for those kind of um, outposts that won't have situation like this in terms of insecurity. So by and large, if we expect the government to take responsibility of ensuring that we have a peaceful environment, we must also augment this with allowing the right narration in terms of our coming together as a people to be genuinely pursued in line with the dictates of you know, civilization or civilized people. What you're saying makes a whole lot of sense. But still, are you satisfied with the way government responded when um, a sudden class of people are fingered in events 
they go unpunished. Sometimes they even come out to claim responsibilities and they go unpunished. Well, between you and I, a lot of um, people fingered for being responsible for various crimes that we've seen across the country, as far as I'm concerned, have largely been on the media. And uh, a lot more of it has been largely on the social media. And to a very large extent, I want to be very cautious in being judgmental. I want to believe that the right information would come out in the mainstream media where government would expect to take responsibilities in terms of carrying out the right actions against people who have made claims of responsibility for those actions of our violence. But by and large, I still feel that at the current situation and the way and manner by which government has handled it, it could be better. It could be better handled. Because at this material time, perception is very critical. And if people, uh, if people perceive government as not responding and um, they feel that they require to hear more that will give them a sense of comfort that there is a big father in the name of government who is there to guide most of the things they see in terms of violence. I think government could do more in terms of information dissemination. Okay, your submissions here have uh, brought to the fore the reality or the existence of um, people trying to control narrative, especially opinion leaders. And so much so you mentioned um, the role of the social media here where everybody is in charge. Everybody becomes an author, a gatekeeper, or so to speak, there are no gatekeepers anymore. But again, let me go to the media now uh, that is supposed to control this rhetoric, con supposed to control this narrative and make sure that they are responsible. I'd like you to verse quickly here, assess, access the role of the media. To me, I think journalists have done very well. And um, yes, we have areas where information that's not been properly checked have been allowed to go into you know, the media and had um, in some cases created wrong opinions. But by and large, the proliferation of the current media system has allowed a lot more information to get to people and people are a lot more aware of things that are happening around them. If for that alone, I think the media has done a good job. But by and large, the necessity for ensuring that uh, the right information gets to the people so that the right perceptions are created for developing the right growth and development in the society, the media has a critical role to play here. And unless investigative journalism is given a major boost to allow for information to flow both ways, then it begins to give us the real perception that we expect to see and uh, which we hope will shape our society for the better environment. Because as it is today, we cannot even measure the levels of uh, damage that comes with having the wrong information in the media and the levels of uh, danger that it portends. But I think that if uh, you know, the right media in terms of uh, investigative journalism is allowed to take a major front role, then it will begin to allow for the right perceptions to be created. And of course, the right responses from government in terms of ensuring that corrections are done and then avoiding future recurrence of bad ones. Okay, um, the issue of ransom payment remains a very, very major um, issue of concern to us, which we're going to have to get to respond to. But that will be after we return from this break. This is Violence Free World. We'll be right back after this timeout.
Welcome back. This is Violence Free World, and my guest is T, His Excellency, the former governor of Kwara State, Governor Abdul Fattah Ahmed. Excellency, um, we hinted at talking on this contentious issues of ransom taking and ransom paying. And a lot of people feel that that very act has in some way kept the act of kidnapping alive. Now, we want to look at what ransom pain does to the act of kidnapping versus the lives that it saves ultimately. Where does this leave us, especially given the fact that members of our security forces have not demonstrated enough capacity to give us an alternative to this kind of rescue? Hmm. For me, you see, it's a very dicey situation, and um, there's no one-way stretch jacket approach to this. As much as it is not desirable to pay ransom to anybody, especially to criminals, you can't afford to allow people's lives to be endangered to the extent that they lose their lives in institutions where ransoms are not paid. But I'm not a poor permanent. I'm not a major proponent of payment of ransom because those who have engaged in acts of kidnapping and other forms of um, criminality and seeking for ransom are truly seeing how beneficial financially that thing is becoming to them. So to a very large extent, the chances of it abating after payment of ransom is very remote. So that's why I don't want to encourage the continuous payment of ransom for this kind of a crime. But at the same time, I want to also look in between on how people's lives are already on the line and requires to be rescued, where it becomes the only solution to bring them alive. We might begin to give it a thought, but to the extent that where it is avoidable, we must insist on ensuring that people are brought back safely without payment of ransom. That is my take. Those acts of criminality that are demanding ransom must be seen to carry the maximum punishment so that in cases where they are caught up with the arms of the law, the maximum, uh, the maximum penalty must be made to be paid. And we expect it to serve as a deterrent to prospective ones. Maximum punishment you have just advocated. Yes. Indeed. And I think that in some way is in place. Now let's look at um, this solution thing now. We, it is obvious now that the numerical strength of our armed forces, our police, it's, it's quite small and um, challengeable, I must say, in court. Now, Everybody is beginning to see the invincibility of the system that we can actually crack this and go scot free. Like it is happening in a lot of places, scenarios, playing out in a lot of scenarios now. Why are we not making this sacrifice of recruiting the much needed numbers of our men and women into the police, into the army, air force, navy, etc.? Where lies our priority? Firstly, just like you said, um, I may not be in the appropriate position to say why we have not carried out additional recruitment to augment the current numbers of security agencies. But I know that um, we are faced with financial challenges as a country. And also, I know that um, in trying to solve security challenges, we must go beyond just numbers. Investment has to go into equipment. In fact, largely more of investment into equipment and new tech to support surveillance and intelligence gathering. These, I think, will play much more important roles than the numbers of people that would, in, that would recruit into the system without equipping them appropriately. So it's a two-way thing. In as much as we want to increase the numbers of security agencies, I think that a lot more investment should go into equipment and intelligence gathering. And if this is properly complemented 
it will allow for even the numbers of security agents as we have them to be much more efficient than they are. It's bad enough that we don't have the numbers and they are not properly equipped, then our situations are worse. And that's where we are where we are today. So I want to suggest that if investment goes into equipment and um, with an increase in numbers of the security agencies, it will certainly change the narrative as we have it today. Okay, now, so many states, several states have been augmenting the efforts of the federal government as far as policing is concerned, or as far as providing for the police is concerned. States provide vehicles, provide monies for all sorts of things just to support the police. And yet, it's not enough. If we, uh, if we turn it to a situation where the norm is for every state to run its own police force, do you frankly think in your mind that every state in Nigeria can afford a police force? No. Certainly not at the current levels of our revenue capacities. States would be able to take on a layer of security agency in the name of state police only if they are able to improve on their current revenue generating profiles. Most states, like I know, are not able to survive without the federation location. Very few states have taken uh, the responsibility of driving their internal generated revenue to levels where it is almost matching their monthly allocations. Except those states that are able to get that close, it is very unlikely they'll be able to take on the state police and manage it accordingly. Because without resources, you can't drive a new institution. But first things first, states must demonstrate capacity to drive their internal revenue to levels where it is going to match their federally allocated funds. Then they are talking about increasing or creating another layer of expenditure in form of state police force. This emphasizes the need for, I mean, more intelligent dialogue for us to find ourselves to, or to get ourselves out of this um, quagmire. And um, there's been rhetoric of fuel everywhere. People are talking to us and talking differently. And some are just playing to the gallery. Like, uh, well, I'm not going to mention names here. But I don't think that's doing us any good. There's this concern of how to be able to manage this dialogue that everyone has called for or has been calling for, just so we're able to find a solution finally to what it is that our issues are. In your opinion, how best do you think we're going to be able to coordinate this dialogue that we so much crave for? Well, if I understand you very well, you are talking of a dialogue of restructuring. Restructure, yeah. That has okay. been talked about at different fora, at different levels. Suggestions have been made and it's been meant to mean different things to different people at different times. Well, in my understanding, you see, I try to give it, um, a, you know, I, I try to give it an analysis in a different way. Firstly, I'll look at why things are not working. Are things not working because of diversity? Certainly not. Because we've seen, we've seen things work in diversified environments. Are things not working because of our religious biases? No. We've seen things work in environments where there are divergent opinions on religious approach. So why have things, why, why have things not worked in Nigeria the way we expect them to work? It tells you one thing clearly, that one, we have not allowed ourselves to follow the rule of law. We make rules, we make regulations, but we don't follow them to the letter. And as long as these are not done, we'll never see any system working, whether it be parliamentary, be it presidential, be it a blend of the two. As long as we have not sat down to recognize the fact that the non-working of these things is resulting from the fact that we have not allowed ourselves to follow the rule of law. You know, it's that simple. Because if you break it down, there is no society that you see that is quite successful today in the world that doesn't have diversity. India is diverse. China is diverse. UK, 
United States even has more diversity than we have in Nigeria in terms of ethnicity and, and religion and race. And yet they're able to coerce themselves into a working team. So why is our own so different? It is different because we have not allowed ourselves to recognize the fact that our strength lies in our diversities. Those things that seek to bring us together are much stronger than those things that seem to be separating us. But we seem to be holding on those things that are separating us. We are not recognizing the fact that things are not working because we have not allowed the rule of law to take its course. You see, diversities can only be managed when you allow the rule of law, which is the common denominator that serves everybody, irrespective of your religion, irrespective of your social cultural background. Once you have the rule of law, it serves as a common denominator. And once it is allowed to be applied to the letter, then everybody will feel satisfied. Well, okay, as um, we grind to a halt now, let's look at inclusiveness as part of the solution. By inclusiveness, I also mean fairness, just so ev everybody feels this sense of belonging as it should actually be. Touch on me the what, what, what we close. You see, once you allow the rule of law to take its course, automatically you have opened the room for inclusiveness. Because every institution that has been established in Nigeria was carefully carved out in ways and manner that it should resonate with every ethnic nationality in Nigeria, i.e. quota system, i.e. federal character, you know, i.e. you know, catchment areas. These are all novel and very noble, you know, programs that were put in place by government at a point in time, either to serve as a catch-up uh, platform for where people were perceived to be a bit below, or it should serve as a sense of inclusiveness in an agreed platform of um, driving a system forward. If those things that were carved out were followed the way they should be followed, i.e. federal character, if federal character was allowed to reflect the principles for which it was set forth for, and was taken to the letter, there's no way every part of Nigeria will not be appropriately represented inclusively. If quota systems that were put in place, designed to allow for inclusiveness, is followed to the letter without compromise, without allowing sectionalism, nepotism, tribalism, or religiosity to play any critical role, you will see that we'll have the benefits of these things. Well, Excellency, I think that's a very, very good point to, to leave it. At this point, I'd like to thank you very much for your, for your time and your views. Um, and I assure you, this is ringing loud and it is clear. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Well, I've been speaking with Abdul Fattah Ahmed, the former governor of Kwara State. Same time next week promises more if you endeavor to be here. This has been Violence Free World. And please remember to remain on the road to a violence-free Nigeria. My name is Kali Igwe, and thank you for watching. No more.